Welcome to my uh, session, uh, Polaris, which is uh, a custom uh, DEC pool server written in PowerShell running on top of Polaris. So you will notice that during this session, I will do some mispronunciations every now and then because Polaris and Polaris, they kind of be really too similar, but it's, it was a fun project to work on. So uh, my name is Ben Valens. I'm a consultant working in the Netherlands for a, co a company called uh, Conditio. I'm a Cloud and Data Center Management MVP and uh, you can find me on uh, Begelens uh, almost everywhere. Um, so, my promise to you about this session, you'll learn how to use Polaris. We, we've seen a couple of sessions already on how Polaris works, right? Uh, just going to reintroduce a little bit of the basics, but I'm going to transition that into uh, pool server routes uh, really fast. Um, you'll be able to use Polaris. Uh, to run a pool server uh, wherever you want. So uh, Windows Client, Windows Server, Linux, Mac OS, whatever. Uh, everything is uh, uh, cross-platform, so uh, you, you can do whatever you want. So the agenda, uh, we talk about a little bit about existing pool servers. Uh, we talk a little bit about the DECPM. Uh, anybody knows the DECPM? Right, so let's address it then. <laughs> Demo. Uh, why build another pool server, Ben? What did you, what, what, what went in, in your mind? Uh, what can I do? Uh, plans moving forward. And uh, there's some dependent modules, but then I promise it's just demos until the end. So, existing pool servers, we got two categories. We got MSFT, so uh, the Microsoft based pool servers, uh, and we got a couple of the community. Uh, the Microsoft based pool server, we got the inbox one and Windows Server. Uh, that's been around, I believe, since 2008 R2. Um, and it, it still exists now with Server 2019 uh, being the latest edition having SQL support. And we, of course, have Azure Automation State Configuration or Azure Automation DSC, uh, as it used to be called. And then we got some community projects, right? We got uh, TOC, uh, which is hosted on the PowerShell or GitHub organization. Um, which is, uh, uh, which is a pool server that implemented the DECPM, so that's the desired state configuration pool model protocol. And it, it, it kind of gives you the freedom to do with, uh, what, whenever the LCM calls into this uh, talk implementation, it, it can run your own script, so you, you define kind of the backend logic. Uh, I have not used it myself, but it, uh, I believe uh, it's, it's pretty good. There's a, another uh, project called DEC Trake. Uh, it's not really active. I don't think it has received a, uh, a commit since over a year, but uh, it's a side project from uh, Mark Gray, who was originally on the DEC team. Uh, and he tried to do the uh, re-implementation of the pool server in Node.js, but in the microservices architecture. And I actually used DEC Trake as a, a kind of a, a sanity check for my work to see if, if he was kind of doing the same things as I was. So. Uh, so the, the DEC uh, PM, or the Desired State Configuration Pool Model Protocol, uh, which is an, uh, a documentation by, provided by Microsoft that uh, explains to you how actually the LCM is interfacing with the pool server, uh, when it's, it's, it's calling, what is in the headers, or what is the expected response, uh, what is the protocol version that it should send, and, and the kind of behavioral uh, part of it. Um, so yeah, if, if you if you want to build your own pool server, this is kind of the, the go-to documentation uh, on the official side. Uh, later on in the uh, in the demos, I'll address some of the the other methods to dig in. So uh, first demo. Um, to set the stage, I got and hopefully I'm I'm not going to increase it anymore because I won't be able to see it myself anymore. Um, I have a VM in Azure, this one is a pool server, and I have another VM in Azure, which is an LCM. So they are able to communicate with each other, and I'm going to do some pretty basic staging here. Um, I'm going to onboard the node into the pool server, have it converge uh, using uh, uh, external non-inbox DSC resource module uh, called Computer Management DSC, uh, and I'm going to install that one right now. Let's clean that a little bit. And as soon as I, I have taken that in, uh, this little uh, red flag will disappear. So we, we, we can have this uh, simple configuration. Let's stage that for that node. So when, once we onboard it, uh, it will uh, set the uh, time zone to be Western European instead of the uh, PST that defaults to, right? So we load that into memory. So we can compile it, and uh, this pool server is making use of the C pool server directory structure. There's the configurations uh, folder, and there's the modules folder. 
Um, so we compile it. Uh, and normally you would create a checksum, but for now, just bear with me. Uh, I'm going to step over this, and we'll see what will happen if we don't provide the checksum file. So same thing goes for the module. Um, the computer management DC module, uh, because it's installed here in this 5.1 or 6.2 PowerShell session, uh, it's installed using the side-by-side -side method. So it has this uh, uh, version folder inside. So it's, it's version 6400. And the pool server doesn't allow for uh, those version folders to be in the archive. So you need to construct the archive using uh, directly the DC resources folder in the, in the top. And you need to give it uh, a certain file name so the pool server is able to figure out what the client is asking for and serve it out. So to do that, we just fetch the version here. And we do a compressed archive from anything that's uh, inside of that computer management DSC folder with that version with a with a slash star. And the destination will be that C pool server modules directory. And the artifact we create is called computer management DSC on the borrower version dot zip, right? This is all basic pool server 101. I, I'm, I'm hoping everybody here already knows about this kind of stuff. So again, we're going to skip the checksum, uh, and we're going to uh, move over to this node uh, called the WSLCM. And that worked, so demo cards are with me. Don't blame me up. So uh, I got this meta configuration here, uh, which will onboard this, this uh, LCM. And uh, th those who, of you who are using pool servers will, will notice something off. Uh, we are onboarding into this WS pool uh, server on port 8080, but we specify a route called API. So that's, that's something you normally uh, don't see, right? Uh, we're using an empty grid, uh, an unsecured connection, demo purposes, fine. And we're specifying that the, the base config will kind of be the bootstrap configuration name uh, for this LCM. So as soon as it's on board, it, it onboards, it's able to pull down this, uh, this configuration. And we also do reporting, so uh, that's also something we want to do. Let's uh, create that metamorph and uh, onboard that machine. And this is kind of crucial, so let's hope it works. <laughs> Yay, so we did a registration uh, for the configuration uh, repository, and we did a registration for the uh, report repository. So both are served by the same pool server. Um, and we are hopefully able to uh, do the update configuration. Uh, so I was too late. The update was already applied. <laughs> Um, too bad. Let's let's check that it has actually uh, did that. Uh, DC configuration. Or was it again? Yes, status. So we we actually got an initial configuration, and when we check DC configuration, we would see that the uh, Western European time zone was set, right? So the thing we just compiled is actually delivered to this uh, to this machine. But hey, didn't we uh, skip over the checksum files? Right. So this is uh, uh, setting the stage. And we'll move to the uh, second part of this demo. And we will investigate this pool server. So um, let's, let's look at the, the file structure, right? So indeed, we have the C pool server directory structure with the configurations and the modules containing the base config.mov and containing the, the, uh, the module file we are dependent upon. But no checksum files. So normally, the pool server would now be able to hand this over to you, right? So there's some magic in, in place here. So um, this is a Windows Server 2019 uh, server, so it probably is using SQL uh, for the backend. I, I know this because I staged the demo. So uh, <laughs> let's just see if we can connect to that uh, SQL uh, backend. So this is using the module DC Pool Server Admin. I did a talk uh, two days ago about this module, which makes it really easy for you to interface with any kind of pool server database uh, that you want, migrate data over and back and forward. If you want to know more, the YouTube video will be up someday. Um, but that registration, that WS LCM machine, uh, well, it's actually in the database. So the registration went through. Uh, and uh, from the looks of it, reports have made it into this uh, pool server as well, right? So that all looks good. So something was working. 
Let's, let's check with DISM because this is PowerShell core running on Windows Server and doesn't know get Windows feature because that doesn't work. Uh, so let's check with DISM if the DSC service is actually installed. And, and as you can see here, the DSC service, the state is disabled. So magic. Magic. I, and, and that's what it says, right? It's black magic. So uh, show the other windows. So this is uh, Ubuntu, uh, WSL. Uh, running on this Windows Server 2019. Uh, I don't think I can increase the font, but I'll try. Oh, maybe I can. Uh, new. Oh, yes, it still works. Okay, cool. So, um, what you see here in the top is an instance of Polaris. So, you, you've been uh, seeing the interaction the LCM had with, with this script, right? So, this is an instance of Polaris. Uh, and uh, it, because it's running on top of Polaris, uh, and I, I configured it to do login to the screen, you can see that the uh, request from the LCM, they came in, and they were parsed and, 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 and handled, and the registrations went through, and uh, reports were ingested, and it, it was able to handle all the things that the pool server would normally do for you, right? So this is uh, to set the state, so now you know I got something that works, and let's talk about it. So why build another pool server? Uh, uh, well, curiosity. I was just curious on what could be done with Polaris. So let's take a, a little bit more advanced Hello World. So I figured let's do a pool server. Uh, so it's my simple project for working with Polaris. Uh, I've already written all the database uh, interactions with, within DC pool server admin. So that part was easy for me. I had no uh, additional work to do to interface with the databases. Was was already covered in another project. I decided to publish it to GitHub and to, to, to kind of see if there was interest. And until now, it's not, there's not been too much. So it's, it's not on uh, the PowerShell gallery yet. But if people are interested, I'm, I'm happy to, to put it on there. But just let me know. So what can it do? Uh, it runs the DECPM, but only partially. It only deals with everything that's, uh, that, that's, that's in front of the LCM. So it doesn't do uh, like a get report, right? Because you could get the reports out of the database using the other module already created. So I decided to just focus on, on the bare minimum where the LCM uh, needs to interface with the backend. So it can handle the registration. It can handle the MOF and module serving. Uh, it generates the checksums itself, right? So it doesn't really need to, uh, to have a checksum file. Uh, it can do the report ingestion. It can run on Windows 10. It can run on Windows Server. Uh, it runs on Linux, as you just, uh, as you just saw. And, and crazily enough, as this is a Mac, I did not try it. So uh, it probably will work. Just now, with Polaris, you've got a, lot, a whole bunch of issues uh, with PS Readline, especially on Linux. So be sure to unload PS Readline, or uh, Polaris will not be able to do anything. Uh, all right, you can run multiple instances on the same box, but that, that's not really uh, that's, that's not really an advantage because you, you could run multiple pool servers anywhere on the same box. Uh, but yeah, it's, you're, you're still able to do that. Uh, and because of DC pool server admin, you can pick the database of choice, right? MDB, EDB, SQL. So plans moving forward, I, I really have none. This, this, as I said uh, before, uh, this, this was an experimentation. I now kind of know how Polaris works. Uh, but if people use it, I could start publishing it to the gallery. Uh, but I, I like to get some incentive on that, that it will be used. I'm not going to put in like uh, a ton more work uh, just, just for my own. Uh, well, I like to see my wife and kids as well, right? So I'll take issues, feature requests. Uh, it's already on, the, on, uh, on GitHub. I'll fix things if, if things are broken. Uh, interest is key. Again, uh, you can go here, github.com, begelen slash Polaris. It's all there. Uh, there's some dependent modules. So we have uh, Polaris, which is a PowerShell module which uh, wraps HTTP listener. Uh, HTTP listener is uh, uh, available in .NET Core, but it has a caveat. It's deprecated. So it's not the same feature set on Windows as it has on Linux. And this is, this is kind of putting me in a terrible place because, uh, for example, the HTTPS handling uh, on Linux is not implemented. You, you can do it on Windows, but you cannot do it on Linux. And that, that kind of, for, well, I, I just decided for this, uh, this session, I, I would not bother. It was hard enough to implement the, the first thing, right? Yes, we could put a reverse proxy in front of it. Exactly. That's, uh, that's uh, something you could do. 
so in my mind, I was already preparing that kind of stuff and said, oh, okay, so, but if I need to put a reverse proxy in front of it, I still, I want to deliver it as a module, so it needs to be easy for the end user. Uh, so they they would not bother uh, setting up uh, a HTTP proxy or, or whatever. So, but that yeah, that's that's not an easy fix, right? It's uh, it's going to take some time. Uh, and the EC Pulsar admin, as already addressed, uh, is the uh, PowerShell module capable of handling all database interactions. So continue to the demo. So that was the last slide, people. Thank you for bearing with me. Part two. Oh, and by the way, everything is on GitHub, right? If you want to walk through, uh, walk in this demo, uh, you can just go to, to my GitHub, uh, Bevelance, go to, uh, DEC, what is it? PSConf EU, <laughs> uh, session zero two, because it's my second session, and there's a deploy button, some, uh, documentation. You can deploy this thing yourself and just see how everything works. So, how does Polaris, sorry, how does Polaris works? So, uh, version 020 is installed, which is really important because version 010 was an entirely different Polaris, uh, which was, uh, written in C Sharp, now it's written in, in PowerShell. Um, it, it got a bunch of commands, uh, and I'll, I'll move over it more quickly as we've seen a Polaris, I think, like a gazillion times in this conference, so it, it's kind of popular, I think. <laughs> Uh, we got a bunch of uh, commands uh, around Polaris uh, that define the routes. Uh, so we got the get route, post route, put route, delete route, and all that kind of stuff, which are basically just wrappers uh, around new Polaris route. So new Polaris route is the, the base function. As soon as you uh, call that, uh, you instantiate an instance of Polaris, and you can add on additional routes, and once you're happy with it, you start it, and it will serve out your API, right? Or your website, if, if you want to, uh, to do that. So we will define uh, a simple hello world route. So new Polaris route, we say slash hello world. So that would be HTTP localhost uh, 8080 or whatever port I'm going to define. Uh, give it the method get. So I could have shortened this with the new Polaris get route, but I decided to do the original one and pass it in a script block. So on everything within the script block, uh, w w that will be get executed as soon as that endpoint will get hit. The script block knows about your session uh, scope. So everything that's defined within the scope of your session will be accessible within that script block because it's, it's operating on that level. So what we will do is uh, we will take the request from the user and just uh, uh, write it to the, to the host. So we can see something happening, right? This is just for deb debugging purposes. It's really nice to see what's going on. Uh, if the request contains a query, so HTTP, uh, whack, whack, uh, some host name, uh, slash route, and then we have a question mark, uh, put in a name equals uh, Ben in my case, uh, there will be a request parameter. So if it contains uh, such a query uh, parameter, uh, we will respond with hello with, with uh, the, the value of that query parameter. If it's not there, we will check in the body if it contains uh, a key with a name, and we will respond that way. And if there's nothing, we just say hello world because we still want to be friendly in this case. <clears throat> so no, no four hundreds, no, no, you're stupid, and uh, yeah. So let's. So we define the route. Now we got an instance of Polaris, and we we can uh, capture that by using the command get Polaris. So when we look at that. Get Polaris, if I can type. We, we can see we have that one route uh, registered with this uh, instance, um, and, well, uh, so some other stuff. So currently it's not running, it doesn't have a port, um, and it doesn't have the, the, the host uh, logging interface enabled, so I'm going to attach this logger, which is just taking everything that's sent out to the Polaris.log and just writes it to the host. Easy peasy. So now we're going to start it, and we're going to start it with a use JSON body parse middleware, which basically just means that, okay, uh, Polaris knows that everything that comes in should be uh, formatted as JSON, and it will uh, serialize it to a, a PS custom object for you, so that you don't have to do that work in every route you define. Okay, and we're going to start it on port 8081, and there we have it. So now we're going to call that function, and to do that, uh, well, not the function, the Polaris uh, route. To do that, we're going to open a new PowerShell session. And the reason why we're opening a new PowerShell session is because I cannot call Polaris within the same session because it will uh, block itself. 
So if, if you do an infogress method in the same session, you're not going to uh, get a response. You're only going to get a control C because you get fed up with it. So uh, let's increase this a little bit. And let's copy this over. Where is it? So we're going to invoke it, uh, invoke REST method, uh, and we're going to send it a post. And the reason we're sending a post is because we did not implement it, and we want to see what will get, what will happen. So method is not allowed because we didn't register a post route. If we do a get, that works fine. Hello world. So I did not define any parameters. I did not define a body. We get a, a simple hello world, right? And we look here uh, in the output. Because I send all the logging information to the screen, we can see uh, that JSON that get uh, passed in in the request, uh, all the information is there. So uh, when you define your script block, you get a whole bunch of stuff to work with, right? Everything that comes in is available to you. You can use it however you see fit. So here we see query string was not was not there and stuff like that. So what else? So this is a query parameter. So it's a, it's a question mark name. So we're going to say hello psconf EU if, if this works out correctly. And it just occurred to me, I did not uh, change the send. So you you got to signal me if, if the time is up. Because I did not, no, no, sure, but I did not change it. So I'm unaware of how far I'm. So anyways, hello psconf EU. So this is expected, right? So uh, we, we got the query. Uh, parameter, and we were able to send a response with the value of that. So another thing we could do is, is specify the body, as I already told you. So this is PSConfU 2019, uh, exclamation mark, just to make it a little bit standing out. We're converting that to JSON, and we're going to specify the, uh, the content type to be application JSON. Um, let's do it like that. Hopefully, no, no, no. So try using a Mac keyboard in an RDP session. So that works, cool. And there we have it. So hello, OP is Confu 2019. So that, that kind of route within my script block works as well, right? So you can also use regex in those, in those routes. And if, if you've worked with uh, the LCM for a long time, uh, you're probably uh, aware of this, this special routes it, it's using to call in the pool server, right? It needs the agent ID to be part of the, the, the query. Well, not the query uh, argument, but it needs to be part of the, the route itself. So what you see here is uh, slash API. And by the way, it's really important to use something behind the, the node. If you don't, if you just specify nodes right after the uh, HTTP localhost colon slash nodes, uh, and you um, um, say to the LCM, I want to register both a uh, configuration repository and a uh, reporting repository, it will persist something. It's calling a cache in JSON locally on disk, and it will not be able to figure out which one it's calling anymore, and it will just throw a terminating exception with an unhandled error. So be sure to have one thing in between. So API, call it Ben, it's, it's fine as well. Just something. Or else everything will break down. Anyways, we can see here that we have this uh, this request parameter as, as, as it's being called. So this is a little bit of, of really simple regex. Is Matthias here? No? Good. Good. This is really simple regex. So uh, it's just defining that the agent ID equals, and then this is the, the parameter itself. So the, the colon ID is uh, letting the uh, Polaris instance know that it should map whatever is in there uh, to, uh, to the ID parameter, as you can see here. And that will be inside of the request parameters.id. So we're just logging that to the screen. Polaris is already running, so we can just add in an additional route. No need to bring it down. Uh, we, we now extended that Polaris instance, and we can call it, but don't forget to call it from the other instance. Like that. Let's see. Yes. So if this works out, I should get a response in the logging that I got a call from that agent ID. So it was able to extract that, that GUID and uh, made it made it uh, made it available to uh, that parameter. So that's that's kind of Polaris 101. I'm going to kill it now, and we'll move over to the next part of the demo. 
So, um, how do you figure out how this LCM protocol is actually implemented? Well, I kind of uh, talked about it a little bit in the slides already. You got the DCPM, so the Desired State Configuration Pool Model Protocol, which is the go-to document if you want to do everything in the official way, right? So that, that's where it states that this is in the header, this is in the body, uh, in this in this uh, certain scenario. But uh, yeah, it, it turns out that reading from libraries is also an option. So um, you, you could use some tools to peek into something that's in the box. You could also uh, put some fiddler in between. So I'm kind of uh, liking that fiddler is able to intercept, like uh, you can proxy anything into fiddler and it will be able to decode if you're using uh, HTTPS or something, but if, if you're doing HTTP, if it's even simpler. You can, you can see the requests and the response in, in a nice communication way. And you can basically, it's, it's like laying a puzzle, right? It's, it's really easy to, um, to work that puzzle out. Uh, look at Drake. Uh, it's it's a, a, an open source example, uh, which is written for, in, in, a, in a really easy way. So Node.js is not hard to read, um, and, and a lot of trial and error. So just observe behavior. Um, I've observed a lot of errors, uh, which I could not explain. And uh, well, sometimes you just keep trying and you trip over the solution, and then you figure out what the problem was. So. We're, we're, what we're going to do now is we're going to hook up that DC pools over admin module uh, I was referring to for a couple of times now. And we're, we're going to try and set up uh, um, a, a registration endpoint um, using database interaction on the pool server. So or on the pool server database. So let's create a connection to the SQL server. And because this connection is defined within my session, within my scope, uh, this will be available within that script block I'm defining within this host, right? So just to see, we still have that node available, so WSLCM is there, so we, we can interface with it. And now what we'll do is we will create a registration route. So this is a simplified version of the registration. And what you can see here is that, again, we handle that API slash nodes, agent ID equals, and then the uh, request parameter. And then we have this script block. We do some logging again, just sending out stuff. We'll check if the protocol version is equal to 2.0. We are only handling uh, Windows Server 2012 plus or WMF 5 plus LCMs here. So they, they are sending in a, a, a protocol version of 2.0. If they don't send it, we're, we're just going to throw an error and uh, basically saying uh, that, that's, that's not what we expected, right? If that actually was okay, then we're going to uh, uh, execute this little piece and we're going to say, okay, uh, the uh, request parameters ID is the agent ID, and we're going to look for the agent ID to be part of the database already. If it's there already, then we have an update. And an update, an update could occur if you uh, generate a new metamorph, uh, for example, to uh, create a new configuration name for your node, uh, you do a re-registration. So this is a possible uh, scenario, right? And you're going to override the configuration names, you're going to override the existing uh, registration. So you're going to end up within the set uh, DC pool server admin registration command. But if the node does not exist, it's going to do um, a new. So it, this, this is the first time the pool server sees the, the, uh, the LCM. Um, then we will uh, say, okay, 204, no content. When you read the DC uh, the DCPM, so the pool model protocol, uh, you will see that it will respond with a 200 according to official documentation. But if you run a pool server from Windows Server, so the inbox one, you observe a 204. So I kind of decided to follow by example instead of by documentation uh, and, and try to reproduce the, the, the thing that's inbox, right? It, it works with 200 as well, but I'm, I just, I'm, I don't know because the, the inbox pool server does a 204. I kind of figured that's probably the best way to go. So let's load this thing into memory. Now we got the instance of, of Polaris, and let's again attach a logger. And by the way, you can attach also a logger that writes to some kind of file or some kind of other mechanism. That's the reason they, they abstracted this a little bit, so, you, so it will be really easy for you uh, to plug in whatever you need yourself. And we're going to uh, start this one, this time on uh, port 8081, because uh, pool hours is still running on, a, on, on a, another port. So we, we don't want to get in its way. 
And what we'll do now is we will onboard this local box into itself. So I'm doing the self thingy. Uh, to do that, we're just going to start with a Windows PowerShell. Um, increase it a little bit to something like that. Let's, uh, and we're going to copy this uh, uh, meta configuration. So, like that. And like that. Oops. Unsure what happened there. Anyways, uh, this is a really simple one, right? It's just onboarding uh, the configuration repository. And as you uh, see, it actually went through. So now if you go back to VS Code, we can see that actually that request came inside of this Polaris implementation of the registration route. Uh, it got this route. It received the put. And that's exactly what we registered. And here we can see the, uh, the body that's being used by the LCDM to do the registration. So we see, okay, it's an LCM version 2. This is the, the node name, all the IP addresses. Uh, there is the registration information here. And, and this contains a, a bunch of, of uh, uh, additional stuff we're not really used to seeing with the inbox pool server. But it turns out the LCM is always sending its certificate information, right? So this is used within Azure Automation DC. So it, when you define your own pool server, you would relatively easy uh, um, uh, well, could, could create the same behavior as Azure Automation DEC does with the, uh, with the certificate handling there. So we see it's public key and stuff like that. We, we, we could extend our database and, and do the, uh, the, uh, the saving of those kind of information in there as well. So the registration message type was configuration repository. And uh, yeah, basically, uh, we created the first instance of, the, of a pool server, right? So let's see, did that thing actually end up in a database? And there we have it, right? So the, the database uh, abstraction through my module also worked. So let's stop this one and move to the uh, last part of the demos. How my own time? Anybody has an idea? Five? Just five? Really? All oh, right, so. I just wanted to go through the code a bit. So, so normally I need a lot more time for code. Um, so this is Polaris. This is how you will find it on, on GitHub. Uh, it's a, a module. This, this brought a whole bunch of, of uh, issues with it. I wanted to package this as an application, deliver it as a module. So in the end, you would be able to do install module, start, pol start Polaris. And th that, would, that would be it, right? Turns out, because Polaris, so the, the, the web stuff, does it know about any other scope than user scope and global scope? It, it, it's not able to peek into the module scope, so to say. So if you have a lot of private functions to do kind of internals, and that's the reason why it's private, right? Uh, you, you still need to export them in some way uh, to, to the, the user scope, or else the script block would not be able to find what, what it needs to do. Uh, I, I was kind of uh, thinking about that, and I figured, well, if I'm going to export all those private functions, then people are going to use those private functions. I'm not, I'm not willing to do that. So I decided to, to build a class. So this is the class uh, Polaris. Uh, it's, by the way, it makes use of, of uh, types coming from other modules, and that's the reason we are using the using module thingies. So we have those classes available to us uh, within that module. And uh, basically, we see here a lot of uh, which would be private functions, which are now hidden methods within this class. And then there is a get Polaris uh, function, which is public and is useful for the end user, uh, which gets called in all the script, uh, script blocks of Polaris as well. So it, it's able to have something that's stored in module scope, be pulled down for use inside of the um, uh, scope that the script block is running in. Um, so, yeah, we see a lot of stuff like test client registration key. So uh, this is, uh, if, if you use a registration key, uh, it, it gets hashed in, in a certain way, and you need to decode it to be able to validate that the GUIDs uh, are matching. So that's in there. Uh, we see things like set error. So uh, like 99.9 .9 times of the times you're talking with the LCM, you're using the same header, so it makes sense to build a function for that, right? Um, that kind of stuff. Uh, 
Is the client valid? Because once the client has done its registration, all the other routes are just checking if the agent is actually in the database. If it's not, then it shouldn't be talking to it. So that's a, a, a 404 or a 400 or something like that. So that's the, the class, which is basically the, the heart of, uh, of that system. So if you look here, ooh. Oh, right, so the niceties of, so we got get, pull, uh, get Polaris, and get Polaris returns the, uh, the instantiated object of Polaris, which is stored in module scope as a, as a variable, right? So it, it will, it will take that in. Um, so if we do, oops, and because P as read line is, is unloaded, or else it would be locking. This is this is terrible typing. Uh, get pool artist, get member. So when you look at it, normally you don't see any of those hidden methods. So somebody needs to really go and look for it um, to to see all those uh, things. Oh, we had a new report. Cool. Get pool artist, get member force, and now you're able to see that. Um, uh, test client header method, test client registration key method. So, the, but I, I'm, I'm fig figuring because they're hidden, people need to really dig into it before they find it. They're probably not going to use it like this. So, this is a compromise, but it's it's you know it ma it makes it uh, um, it makes it possible for me to deliver something uh, that doesn't expose too much UX, uh, which the user could well couldn't use anyways. So. So what else is in there? Um, uh, a more fully featured version of the registration route. So what I decided to do is just define a bunch of script blocks and then within the start uh, Polaris function, basically just uh, do a, a loop over all the uh, script blocks and register them with the correct uh, routes. So here you can see uh, get Polaris, which I also ran with the, the public implementation, uh, is, is, is run inside of that script block. It takes it uh, uh, locally, and now we have it available. So we can uh, say pull hours, test client header, we have that method there. Um, and here is, uh, this is why it's a little bit more expanded, because in certain uh, situations, so if, if it's not a configuration registration, but a report registration, for example, you actually cannot override the configuration names. This is not expected. Um, there's a whole bunch more. Uh, what, what else? Um, the action route. So this is the place where the um, uh, checksums are, are actually validated. So uh, we will check from the database because the database is always leading. The LCM only communicates with the pool server in uh, registration time what its configuration name is. From that point on, uh, from that point on, the pool server is always in charge about the configuration name. So if you change it server side then the server side will say, okay, I'm going to look for a moth with a new name, and I will provide you uh, with that moth if the checksum you are telling me is different from the checksum I know about. So it, it will look on disk for, uh, for that file. If it founds the file, uh, or if, if, it if it does not found the file, then it says, okay, you don't have anything to do. If it does find the file, uh, it will uh, see if from the request, so the LCM sends it in the request, if the checksums are equal, so we check the, uh, the, the current file checksum and the LCM told us the last checksum version it knows about. If those are equal, we say, okay, nothing for you to do. If they are off, we're gonna say, hey, you need to go and get your configuration. Something's changed. So. And then we have the uh, configuration route, which is actually uh, reading that file and sending it as an octet stream to the LCM. And this, by the way, is a, a, one of the reasons I was not able to do this in Universal Dashboard. I also tried, tried it there. This Universal Dashboard is built on ASP.NET Core, but it does not implement the, um, uh, the class uh, where the, uh, I, I'm not really sure about the class name, but it's, it's called Download Manager, I think, something like that. So we're not able to to stream that uh, octet stream from Universal Dashboard yet. This, so if, if, if you guys think, oh, maybe it's a better idea to move it to that kind of project, sure, so it's MIT licensed, you can go ahead and fork it and make it your own, uh, and maybe bug Adam Driscoll about not implementing that class yet. So 
But for the rest, universal dashboard works awesomely. So, um, module route, so that's basically the same as the file route. Report route, that's just ingesting reports sent by the LCM. Uh, actually, it turns out LCM is resending the same report multiple times, um, but extending the data it, it sends uh, to the pool server. So you need to do some logic to see if, if a report already exists inside of the database. If it already exists, you need to expand the data to it. And uh, if it does not exist, you need to create it for the first time. So here's the start Polaris. So that's, that's the thing the user would interface with. It takes a bunch of parameters. So you need to define the pool server database connection up front. This is not handled within Polaris because, well, just additional complexity is not necessary. Uh, you, you give it a configuration directory, a module directory, uh, a certain amount of, of GUIs you want to be valid for authorization. Um, and it will instantiate a, a, an object of that class. We'll start Polaris, and then it will just iterate over all those routes and, and add it to uh, the, the Polaris instance, uh, as you can see here. And it will then give you back the, uh, the instance itself. What else? We got stop, of course, and uh, we got get. So, And that basically is, is it. So. Uh, um, to summarize, before we go to the que questions, and I hope there are questions, uh, uh, Polaris is built on Polaris and DC Pulsar Admin. It's an experiment. It, it, it turns out to be working just fine. Um, uh, since Polaris and uh, Pulsar Admin are XPLAT, so is Polaris, so you can run it anywhere. It's easy to fork, make it your own. Uh, contribute. It's all written in, in, in uh, PowerShell, so no C Sharp, no magic. You can just, well, extend it if you like. Uh, so, questions? I got a question. So the, the question is, uh, will it be uh, a one by one, so first in, first out handling, or, or will it respond uh, with multiple uh, runs in the same time? I don't think threading is, is implemented in Polaris. I'm not 100% sure, but I think it's just a first in, first out. So uh, it will probably block the second LCM coming in when the first LCM is, is handling. It will block it until it's open. So if it's within the TCP uh, timeout window, then everything will just work. But this will probably not scale too well. I, I, I wouldn't suggest putting a thousand nodes on top of this script. Other question. So the question is, does it uh, support HTTPS? So a uh, small modification, and you get out working on Windows. Uh, if you want to run that on Linux, then no. You, then you need to do some additional work, like uh, uh, put uh, Apache in front of it, or uh, whatever. Yeah. More questions? Bruce. Uh, sorry, I did not hear that entirely. Yes. So uh, Bruce is suggesting an alternative way of, of working with this, but the thing is that uh, the implementation there is actually in Polaris and not Polaris, so I'm utilizing their framework, uh, and they're using, and I, I think I glossed over it a little bit, um, they're using something for the uh, event handling, uh, which, which is not capable of looking inside of that module scope. So if I would change it, then I need to uh, contribute to Polaris instead of my own work, and I didn't want to go that far. So. Yes. So you will get a degree of concurrency. While the request will be off and running, and then get queued to process later, as soon as they give you the request, so it's even different. Yeah, I, I think they, they, um, they changed that behavior since version, the, the zero one version was, was a C sharp based version, and they moved it to, uh, to script. 
entirely. And from that point on, they, they shifted to, uh, to a commandlet that does the, um, I can, I can look it up. All right, all right, all right. So uh, Bruce is pointing out I'm not too aware about what I'm using, and uh, <laughs> fine. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for pointing that out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Any more questions? Then I'd like to finish up. Thank you. <laughs>